Ça se passe bien. Ok, we start. Euh, bonsoir à, à tout le monde. Bienvenue à notre webinaire French Neurosurgery Go Round. Aujourd'hui, on n'a pas eu le, on a eu quelques soucis de, parce qu'il y a d'autres réunions, donc d'autres webinaires et John Bennett est ailleurs. Donc, on a fait un deuxième Zoom à côté pour pouvoir honorer le rendez-vous avec le professeur Prévedello. Uh, professeur Prévedello, welcome to our uh, webinar. Uh, it's a great honor to have you with us. So uh, I start with uh, uh, an introduction. I'm uh, in uh, Rainan Island from uh, about uh, 26 years. Uh, we uh, we have uh, this is my team with the young uh, surgeons, uh, with uh, actually uh, this, uh, uh, some uh, neurosurgeon. Uh, Cardo, uh, Thibault de Joibert uh, here, uh, the, um, Frepel, Sebastian Frepel. Uh, I don't know if you can. And uh, Guillaume Le Mestre et, uh, and uh, Paloma Campes. Uh, we, Rayon Island is. Uh, excuse me. Uh, for from uh, Paris is for about uh, 11 hours. It's beautiful islands the, with uh, uh, many places, uh, interesting many places. Uh, the uh, it's a problem with connection, uh, I think. Approach according to the others. Unfortunately, this method. Excuse me. Hola. Uh, uh, this is uh, Rayonum Island, uh, and this is Mauritius. The, this is uh, a French department, and another French department, it's uh, Mayotte. And uh, here they are the same population, like a Comor uh, island. And the uh, population of Mayotte chose to be French, to still French. So this, this is the last department of French, French department in this uh, uh, region. And uh, we have uh, uh, many historical cases. Uh, they come from Comores or uh, Mozambique, uh, and uh, they uh, are transferred uh, to our department. <coughs> We, uh, th there are many uh, uh, population with uh, different religion and culture, and they uh, all they live uh, in peace. And this is a, a, a unique uh, uh, model of uh, uh, integration, the, what we call le uh, vivre ensemble, to live together. <clears throat> there are many places. Our volcano, it's a beautiful uh, spectacle. <laughs> we have the beautiful spectacle with this uh, volcano. And uh, I, I introduce you, Professor uh, Previdello. Professor Previdello was born in, uh, and raised in Curitiba in Brazil. He is vice chair of academic affairs and a professor of the Department of Neurosurgery. He is director of minimally invasive corneal surgery program at Jens and Wexner uh, Medical Center, OIU State University. He graduated from medical school in uh, 2000 from Federal University of uh, Paraná, uh, Curitiba, Brazil. His uh, residency in neurosurgery was completed uh, at the hospital of uh, uh, Curitiba, uh, Brazil in uh, 2005. He completed his uh, fellowship in pituitary surgery and epilepsy at University uh, of Virginia in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, Dr. Uh, Providello uh, then moved uh, to, to University of Pittsburgh School uh, of Medicine, where he completed his uh, uh, clinical fellowship. <coughs> and uh, 
uh, in cerebrovascular uh, and skull based surgery in the Department of Nurse Surgery, uh, Surgical Surgery in Pennsylvania from uh, two eight, uh, 2008 to uh, 2010. He was assistant professor uh, of University uh, of Pittsburgh. He became a staff member of Ohio State University on July 2010. Uh, he uh, do, uh, did his uh, fellowship uh, in pituitary surgery, neuroendocrinology, and epilepsy uh, at University of Virginia uh, um, in uh, 2006, uh, and uh, fellowship in school base and cerebrovascular surgery in uh, 2008. His uh, clinical interest is, uh, is the simulation and neurosurgery, minimally invasive approaches, neuro and uh, school based uh, anatomy, innovation and technology for uh, neurosurgery, novel therapy, uh, therapies, Benin and marine school based and brain tumors. He's author of a book of endoscopic and nasal school based surgery. Authors of many chapters for many, for, uh, many uh, neurosurgical books. Uh, he's uh, author of more than 100 uh, articles in high level neurosurgical review. And finally, uh, I, I, I will speak in French. Uh, C'est le cours, c'est un des meilleurs cours actuellement au monde qui se passe. C'est le state of art of uh, endoscopic school based surgery. C'est des cours qui sont uh, donnés à Columbus, Ohio. Et uh, uh, je vous conseille de, de participer à, à, à ces cours si vous avez uh, le, le, la possibilité. Et uh, je serai heureux d'être parmi eux uh, bientôt le mois de mai. I will be there in May uh, with you, Professor Provedelo. You're welcome. It's an honor. Yeah, Thank it's you. an honor to be here. A privilege. Thank you so much. And uh, it will be very, uh, very nice to have you here with us in uh, basically in uh, what in a month, month and a half. Basically, it's going to go quick. Um, as I said earlier, after that introduction. Really, I hope that you invite me in person there. You know that will be that will be amazing to visit the I island. I just I just want to make sure when I'm there that uh, that you don't activate the volcano. Just keep it the volcano calm there, like when when I'm yeah. there. But I'm sure I'm sure that is beautiful when that is in activation and uh, and uh, amazing pictures. So yeah, so I can start inviting everybody who I think we. We almost full here, but be happy to have uh, those interested in our course in May. And uh, Dr. Taha will be here. And uh, for now, I will uh, share my screen. I think you need to allow yes. me to share my screen for for next. Uh, and uh, you know, I apologize. I don't speak French. I do. I do speak a language of your neighbor country there. I speak Portuguese, you know, as a, as a uh, ah. Mozambique is right there. And, uh, you know, I, ah, yes. I'm from Brazil and grew up in Brazil, but uh, ah, yes. I, do, I do speak it, it, Spanish okay. and Italian, but uh, it, French, my daughters are st studying French. So maybe next time I travel with my family there, they can help me. Okay, okay, you're welcome, you're welcome. Uh, yeah, no, thank you so much. So, Thank you. Um, so um, I'll talk a little bit about the, the role of endoscopic and nasal surgery um, in SCOBASE. Uh, so I think what I'm going to try to show is some uh, examples and some of the uh, indications that we um, analyze and we indicate endoscopic uh, nasal surgery. Let me, uh, this is our team here. So I'm going to go straight to real scope based surgery. I'm going to skip some of the pituitary uh, pituitary adenomas. I think it's very well established. And uh, I'm going to try to show more of the expanded approach. So one of the principles of endoscopic and nasal approaches really follows the uh, principles of scope base when we don't need to really do um, retraction on the brain and uh, follows the, the principles that we try to remove more bone and uh, to avoid manipulation of the brain. So initially in the history of neurosurgery, we had uh, like 
retracting brain and then scobase revolution in the 80s where you will remove more bone to get access to the scobase without retracting brain and with the endonasal we drop that angle even further down so we can really manipulate all these areas without uh, touching the brain so it's really uh, a neat way to uh, do scobase surgery when we do this we convert uh, all the chambers of this the nasal sinus uh, areas into one single cavity very important to always do dissection with both hands. The ENT is in the beginning of the endoscopic and the nasal surgery, they will work with only one hand. And it's very important that we do microsurgery. Microsurgery, we are doing basically microsurgery through the nose using the endoscope for visualization. And we really believe in teamwork. Like I do all these cases with the ENT partner. And I think that's crucial uh, for the care of the nose as well as the uh, post-operative care uh, to make sure people do very well. So a tumor like this in the scobase, we convert that to a convexity tumor instead of uh, uh, considering something that is more difficult. It becomes basically exactly like a convexity tumor. If you look at this, we will devascularize that tumor. We will debulk it. And then eventually we'll go around and dissect it from the brain. Uh, small tumors at the skull base can actually achieve a, a Simpson 1 uh, much more often because you remove the bone that is involved uh, to the base of that tumor. And all the reconstructions we perform with the vascularized tissue. So very important to use the nasal septal flat vascularized on the posterior nasal artery uh, when we do these reconstructions. So uh, tumors like this, um, uh, tuberculum cell meningioma, for the most part, we always perform endoscopic endonasal because we can have a very good visualization of the uh, tumor entering the optic canals and also the uh, interface with the base of the uh, chiasm and also uh, the uh, inner part of the optic canals. Because if you remember when you do this with a terional, you do end up like having a blind spot under that optic nerve ipsilaterally. And when we come into nasal, you basically get to see both nerves and you get a good control of that approach and that the disease in those areas. This is just an example of a post-operative MRI. You see the uh, enhancing nasal septal flap, the enhancing pituitary gland. Those are the things we look after the surgery when we do uh, MRI. Very important to, be, to really respect the superior hypophyseal arteries. This is an important concept because the, some of the blood supply of the optic nerves, it, it comes from the superior hypophysial artery. Have in mind that in many angiomas, that artery is pushed backwards and in cranial pharyngioma, because it comes from the stalk, those tumors push those superior hypophysial arteries forward against the dura. So when you open the dura in cranial pharyngiomas, you gotta be very careful uh, and vigilant uh, in order to preserve the blood supply of the chiasm. So for meningiomas, these are just some examples of some of these uh, meningiomas that we've done. We've done more than 50 of these now, but these are just example here, 10 of them. Um, as you can see, these are all operated endonasal and give you a good, a good understanding of the potential. And uh, even those more lateral is spread, we actually can reach endonasal. Very important to have a very good exposure uh, to reach this type of visualization at the end of the surgery where you see the superior hypophysial artery there, preserve the stalk, the chiasm. And this is what you see at the very end with the carotid. So we have to open carotid from carotid to carotid. And usually for meningiomas, I don't open the superior intercavernous sinus. I keep that intact because the disease is on the second floor. Basically the disease is above the cellar environment. The other technology we've been using for some of these uh, approaches is um, ICG. So you can see here, you can actually uh, see where the carotids are. So when you're doing the approach, uh, they really light up uh, the carotid position and also some of the blood supply at the base of this meningioma. So here you can see we're using the um, uh, bipolar to coagulate the base of these meningiomas. This is a small meningioma, but shows very well the indication how you basically take these tumors without touching the brain and preserving even the arachnoid on the other side. This was a patient that was losing vision on the left side. As you can see, it's small, but, it's, but it was pushing that optic nerve. And uh, the, uh, this is at the end of the surgery with ICG here, and we are coagulating the uh, insertion. And you can see 
how beautiful you can take these uh, tumors, see the superior hypophysial artery at the end and the carotid there. Um, and you can take these tumors without really touching the uh, neurovascular structures. Here are other examples. As you can see here, the, one of the questions is what, what if you open the, uh, you know, how do you open the optic canal? I started my career uh, doing this type of opening using the daisy scissors. They work well, like to open retrograde. And then uh, you can see here the optic nerve uh, coming on the left side. This is the carotid ophthalmic artery. And this is a little bit of tumor that was in between the carotid and the optic nerve that we had to really go there and, and take it out with a blunt, uh, blunt hook. Uh, this is all the supracellar uh, approach here. And uh, you can see that little piece of meningioma. That was the last piece of the meningioma there that we took it out. And you can see how you can take these tumors out of the optic canal as well as the uh, more lateral. And this is the type of resection that we can get. Um, always looking at the um, flap and the enhancement of the stalk. This is another example here using the daisy scissors, how they cut in an angle. This is also meningioma opening the optic canal for decompression. And this is the way we, we did for several years, open like a fillet. And you can see here opening like that. And, uh, and then we will decompress the optic nerve all the way to analogzine. And you see the olf olfactory nerve up there. But nowadays I designed this little, uh, little knife here. Uh, as a disclose, I do get royalties uh, for this knife, but uh, I love this knife. Uh, it's made by Feather uh, from Japan. And I basically just hook at the canal there. You see, this is the, the right optic canal and just slide it forward. It's much easier and is effective and, the, and is blunt on the tip. So it doesn't cut the optic nerve. I come all the way to analogzine. See, it goes back and, the, and then um, you can explore here and, and see the optic nerves right there. And then you can really remove the um, meningioma that was more anterior in the canal. I really like that, that, that knife, I'm, you know, one of those uh, happy that we, uh, we created that. Um, larger tumors, um, this was one of the first in my career that I thought about doing a stage approach. She was 48 year old lady at that time going blind. She was bilateral, like a, a 2800, very down visualization. On a tumor, and the uh, 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 tumor was going all the way to the basilar artery there. Where are we? And then uh, here is dissecting the, the tumor. You see the, uh, the bifurcation of the carotid artery there with the anterior cerebral artery. Dr. Kizuki, Dr. Kizuki, can you mute your phone? And uh, here is the visualization at the end after resecting this tumor. You see the, the, the optic nerve so intensely uh, compressed. You can even see uh, the, um, the uh, anterior cerebral artery by transparency on the other side, the interhemispheric fissure. And then you can use an angoscope to look around. Uh, but this was an interesting case because it was with. Uh, a good exposure, we were able actually to got the, get the tumor in only one approach. Uh, there was no need for a second approach. And you can see here the, the pituitary gland and the uh, vascularization uh, flap uh, preserved there. So the, it's not because of the size of the tumor that we're gonna go endonasal all the time. If you look at this, is a, you have to really analyze case by case. So this is a case, if you look at this coronal, it comes on top of the optic canal and um, invades from the top. And when you go back and forth, the optic nerve was pushed down as this tumor was more like a plenum uh, meningioma pushing the, the nerve down. So if we did endonasal, we will be like seeing the optic nerve first here. So that doesn't make any sense. So in this case, we did an eyebrow with a subfrontal approach and really uh, remove the whole tumor out. This is the post-op. Uh, with a craniotomy, traditional, just a eyebrow, minimal invasive as well. So you have to really analyze case by case. It's not because you can do endonasia, you're gonna push endonasia, you have to look case by case. This is another example that the anterior cerebral arts were completely encased and the optic nerve was really curved here. Um, 
that looking at this imaging, we can eh, maybe I still can do endonasal, but this is the problem. See the optic nerve is right here and the disease implants uh, on the anterior cline are the lateral to the optic nerve. This is something for me that is, if I go into naso, I know I will not be able to remove this corner of the tumor. So in this case, I did, a, I did an open front orbital craniotomy and got that whole tumor out, the patient did very well. So you have to really look case by case uh, when you indicate these uh, surgeries. Uh, this is another example of anterior scobase meningioma with the patient who uh, lost smell and had edema on the brain and it doesn't touch the anterior cerebral artery. So in this case, is uh, come in donaso, it's uh, an advantage because we don't touch the anterior cerebral um, arteries and we don't touch the, uh, the brain basically right there. And this is the post-op on these cases. Uh, and we published a couple of papers showing that when you don't touch the brain, you, you don't really leave much of a footprint in the brain, no encephalomalacia. So the encephalomalacia is much reduced, the, the edema gets better uh, after surgery. Then we go for these big ones, like, and the question is what to do with these large ones, you know, like, is there a role for endonasal surgery on this? And uh, early in my career, I tried to push, and this is an example of a patient I did in a more than one uh, stage. And um, I went there and I went to the second stage and I'll, I'll show you here the video, how at the end of the case, uh, this is the second stage when we're rolling that tumor out and finding the chiasm, big tumor. And this was invading around the anterior cerebral arteries, as you can see here, very difficult, but I was able to really, really go around it and dissect and, and, and get this tumor resected out of there. So I was very happy with the, the, the resection. But if you look at here, there is enhancement on top of the clinoids. And that's kind of the way I learned that that's a limitation of the approach there. And patient did very well. He had like uh, psychiatric problems and he got better. And then um, I followed him. And five years later, you will see here the tumor recur basically on top of the clinoids. And I had to do a craniotomy to get that out of there. Um, and um, I learned a lot of showing the limitations of the, of the approach. The other thing to take in consideration is smell, like olfaction function. So a patient came with this from another state here in, uh, in America, and he won an endonasal surgery, but I analyzed this and you see how much spread laterally above and lateral the optic canals with some brain edema. So in this case, I came on the right side, did an eyebrow uh, and a, a resection there, and I got the whole tumor out, uh, preserving his smell. So the fact that he had smell before surgery made me uh, really forced uh, to do a, a, a open approach, uh, plus the fact that he had disease on top of the optic canals. This is another patient that came with normal smell to see me. He also wanted endonasal. He heard about it. He looked it online, and he was 78, if I remember correctly, but he very intellectual man, he enjoyed his wine and he had this disease. Um, if you look at this coronal here, the olfactory groove on the right side was normal. The disease was just on the left. So I, and there was some edema on the left here. So when I see edema on the left side, I still do like a or, orbital, I remove the orbit in this uh, case. And that's what I did, I put the orbit back and, um, and, uh, and then there was uh, less, uh, less edema there. Let me just, I uh, don't know, I have, can you still see or no? No, we can't, sorry. Let me, no. uh, let me share again because uh, I got pushed out for some reason. Sure. Here we go. You can see it now, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so, so this is the post-op and you can see we uh, were able to get the whole tumor out and preserve smell for this gentleman. Um, and uh, with an open approach. So open approach is something you, you should always consider. And then you ask me, why not doing open approaches all the time, right? Because, you know, that's, uh, it seems to work well. So I'll show you this case, very interesting. A patient that had uh, 10 years before me had this tumor resected by another neurosurgeon. He did a good job, maybe a little more encephalomalacia, but not too bad, no big infarct. This was in the archives of our university here. And the problem here is really he left this hyperostosis. The hyperostosis has tumor on it. 
And then unfortunately this patient uh, lost follow-up because the neurosurgeon left the university. And then this patient came back uh, going blind to my clinic 10 years later. And you can see that that hyperostosis turned into another effector groove tumor and a tuberculum cell in meningioma. She was losing vision. We went back and donazo complement the resection and took it out and, and she's doing very well, recover her vision. So this shows uh, the importance of complementary. I, I didn't want to, want to go through the scar of a, another craniotomy. So coming in donazo was really, um, you know, complementary for the craniotomy and she did very well. So I start thinking like that uh, for tumors that I know I cannot remove endonasal completely it has this whole lateral extension. And if I do craniotomy, it will be very difficult to clean all this hyperostosis, right? So then I start thinking about, well, why not uh, two stages? So I will come endonasal, drill the hyperostosis, ligate the anterior and posterior etmoidal arteries and debulk the tumor in internally without touching the interface between the brain and the tumor. So then I come back in a second stage, three, four months later, and it looks like this. The vascularization went away, the tumor collapses, the edema gets better, and I just need a small craniotomy now, usually a frontal lateral on the right side to then take the rest of the tumor, uh, the tumor out. And I think this is what gets the closest to a Simpson one that it can get on these very large complex cases of the anterior skull base. So I don't force any more two endoscopic. I just do one stage on the nasal, one stage open, and I'm being very happy with the results. I think I've done a little over 10 of these cases at this point, and uh, with uh, very good results uh, using this uh, combination of approaches. So some other tumors that we take care of, uh, these are stesial neuroblastomas, as you can see here. Those are uh, tumors that we often approach on donazo as well these days. Um, as you can see here, this is an example. This is another patient with a stesial neuroblastoma here, as you can see. Uh, and we approach them with the transcribiform um, uh, like approach directly. And uh, you can see here drilling from below. Uh, taking the, uh, the bone out, exposing the dura of the anterior skull base and opening the dura around the olfactory uh, bulb and lateral to the olfactory tracts. Here, we gotta be careful not to uh, hurt the brain as you do those maneuvers and then come on uh, more anteriorly. And, you know, in one point here, we have to cut the fox. So that's the way we cut the fox anteriorly there with the cuts all the way to the free edge. You have to be careful and watch, make sure there's no branch of any uh, a branch of the anterior cerebral artery. Then we rotate it down. As the stesial neuroblastomas, they start in the olfactory tract. So we have to cut the olfactory tracts and we send that to pathology for margins like this stump here, this stump there. And we also send margins on the dura and then um, and make sure that we got a oncological resection of this, uh, of this tumor. And then we perform reconstruction with the collagen matrix that we inserted uh, in lay. See the, the, the base of the frontal lobes there after resection. And then we put uh, the uh, collagen in lay. And then uh, we follow with, uh, usually we put some fat in this sphenoid sinus and, uh, and then the nasoceptal flap that you need to make sure doesn't have residual tumor as well by sending margins. And sometimes you put this U-clip uh, stitch there to keep the flap in place. And that's the way it looks like uh, covered from below. And uh, of course, it's not free of complications. You can also have uh, CSF leak. Sometimes we use lumbar drain if that happens, but we never use lumbar drains as the primary uh, condition. Basically, we do the surgery, do the best reconstruction that we can, and then if that patient leaks, comes back to the operator room, that's when we put a lumbar drain on, the, on that second surgery. The other tumor that is very helpful uh, to have the endonasal armamentarium uh, in your um, part of what you do is the craniopharyngioma. So this is a craniopharyngioma you can see here. Um, let me just show you how we uh, open. Sometimes it's not pneumatized and Neuro navigation does help uh, in these cases. And here is opening the dura. Always when we open the dura in craniopharyngiomas, we are uh, looking for uh, those uh, superior hypophyseal arteries, as I mentioned earlier. And here opening the arachnoid. That's the uh, tumor that is located in the, uh, 
uh, supracellular space, then we can find the stock. This is what we call type one. And uh, I can speak for one hour about craniopharyngiomas. Maybe in the future, I can talk to you guys again. But here you, you see that this type one is what we call basically tumor between the pituitary stalk and the optic chiasm. And this is a, a myriad device that we do the debulking. And then here, we basically dissected it away from the optic nerve and from the stalk, and eventually able to uh, remove that tumor out of there, um, dissecting the walls of the hypothalamus. And uh, here you see when we pull it out after dissection, uh, we noticed that it was free on the surroundings. And then we uh, put the camera there and you will see, this is the view of the uh, third ventricle from below. You see the from a Monroe and the, and we do the reconstruction with collagen matrix and the nasal septal flap. So this patient did very well initially, and, and I put this in purpose here because it was considered a complete resection, one, two, three, four years doing MRIs. On the fifth year, that patient came back with, with, the, with the recurrence. And that's why you have to be very vigilant with craniopharyngiomas. Uh, this is uh, examples of craniopharyngiomas that we do endonasal. For the most part, we indicate uh, endoscopic endonasal surgery for craniopharyngiomas because you have a midline approach for a midline lesion and you approach from caudal to cranial. So it gives a very good uh, angle for resection. So this is that patient that I showed the video uh, five years later with that recurrence next to the anterior cerebral arteries. When we analyzed this, it was eccentric. It looked like it was on top of the left, the right optic nerve. So instead of going to nasal again here, we complement with an eyebrow approach. And just real quick here to show you how uh, with the eyebrow, uh, we opened the cistern lateral to the tumor and uh, dissected the tumor away from the optic. And here, this is the best video that show how this will be almost impossible to do from below because it was really sitting on top of the optic nerve. And here we are dissecting the, that medial interface then we follow that uh, dissection back to the chiasm and found the other cranial nerve, uh, optic nerve on contralaterally. And then we dissect that tumor uh, away from the uh, anterior cerebral artery, as you can see here, and, uh, and got that tumor through an eyebrow approach. So here's the way it looked like at the end with the chiasm uh, preserved. And, uh, and here closing the eyebrow incision, uh, closing the dura primarily. And then we put the bone back and uh, she did uh, very well initially. Um, just very quickly, I'll tell you, like she's an old lady and she had multiple sclerosis and I made a mistake that I learned later. She had this residual and I decided to give radiation on this to uh, uh, make sure this will not come back. And uh, unfortunately, her multiple sclerosis got a lot worse after the radiation and she uh, eventually actually had a very severe uh, form of multiple sclerosis and had pneumonias and actually ended up dying about, uh, I think it was about six to six months to a year after that uh, craniotomy that we did. And it was all a consequence of the radiation. So be, be aware of that. You don't want to give radiation to people with multiple sclerosis. Um, uh, so these are other examples and show the complementary aspect of, uh, of, um, endoscopic and, and craniotomy. Big tumors of the third ventricle like this, the optic chiasmus pushed down. So I felt if I went endonasal, I'll be really stuck on a small corridor. So this, I prefer transcalosal. I come with the transcalosal, have a nice view. You can work on both sides of the, uh, of the uh, septopelucidum. You can see the fornix. I do a, 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 a basically a transcoroidal approach bigger uh, to get a bigger access to the third ventricle. And that's what we got. I got it out. Uh, the anterior part, I was dealing too much with the uh, fornix, and I felt that I didn't have an angle to see where the chiasm was. I felt I was doing blind dissection. So I decided, and I left this little piece after the craniotomy. So a few months later, I came back and I did endonasal approach and boom, took the rest out. So really, Beautiful uh, complementation here. This patient is about five years out and no recurrence. He was already pun hypopit in the presentation, but his vision loss improved and his mentation, his cognition got better as well. He is back to work and he just uh, have supplementation of hormones. So he's uh, doing very well. 
So some examples of going out to more posterior fossa, this is a rare form of a, a meningioma. This is the dorsum cell meningioma. It's a nice case because it shows uh, some um, uh, in, the difference between microscopy and, and endonasal endoscopic. So this uh, tumor pushes the stock forward. It was not my patient. It was uh, my partner doing the surgery. So he, he was doing a transphenoidal with the microscope uh, for this tumor. Patient was losing vision. And this is the view of the microscope. It's actually not a bad deal. Uh, this surgeon was very good, opening the dura, did an extended approach above the gland. See the gland is here, the stock is there. He operated around the stock and was able to debulk the tumor. And uh, to make this story short here, in one point he called me and said, hey, Danny, can you come at the endoscope and see if you can do a little better job here, maybe take more of the tumor? Because he felt that he couldn't go more behind the gland with the transphenoidal, with the microscope. So I came, I called Rick Corral and said, hey, Rick, can you help me here, like my ENT partner? And uh, we put the endoscope, we had to remove the speculum because it was too much of a, of a tight space. And then we rotate that gland out of there. I did a hemitransposition here on the, on the, on the left side, exposed the, uh, the, dorsum, uh, the dorsum there. Here, the, uh, behind the, uh, showing uh, behind the, uh, the cella there, we were able to disconnect from the left side. We went and removed the uh, uh, posterior clinoid. See the carotid is right here. I had to skeletonize a little more in order to do this approach. And um, then we are uh, able to go behind the gland and dissect that from the posterior fossa behind the gland. And you can see here the, 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 the basilar artery. And we were able to get this nice view by working above, below, and also through the left corner of the gland here. So at the end, it looked like this. Uh, you can see the uh, gland preserved, the stock preserved, and all the whole tumor removed with the gland still connect to the right side. I call this the hemi-transposition, and that's what uh, we've been doing over the years. Uh, for the Initially, in my career, I did more of the full transposition when both sides disconnected, but I, I, I felt that I was losing more function of the pituitary gland. I think it was from venous congestion, and by keeping one side attached, I think the gland drains very nicely, and we were able to get that out of there. So this is the way it looks like in an MRI post-op, enhancing gland, enhancing stock, and this is the collagen uh, that we put it around with the flap and no leak here. She did have a permanent diabetes in situs, very mild. She'd just take a half a tablet at night and, uh, and the rest of the pituitary gland is normal. So other examples, like in terms of the limit of endonasal, this is a clival meningioma. So I, I always look how much the tumor is touching, a petroclival meningioma is touching the petrous surface versus the clival surface. If it's more on the clivus, I still do endonasal. And this is, the limit is the sixth cranial nerve laterally here. This is at the end of that surgery. And you can see here the, the, the sixth cranial nerve traveling through the cistern. And this is the last piece of meningioma that is there. So we can take that piece medial to the sixth cranial nerve and any disease lateral to the sixth cranial nerve, I, I would design a different approach. You cannot really go there without affecting that sixth cranial nerve. So this is a beautiful example of the, of the, me, the medial aspect as being the limit for the approach endonasal. This is a, another interesting case here. Let me show you. This is a tumor that, that was growing in this young lady. So six months later showed like a significant growth. I was just watching, as you can see there. And I noticed that this tumor was between the third and the sixth cranial nerve when I analyzed the MRIs. So I went in Donezo because I felt that we could go uh, through uh, that, uh, that approach. And uh, here I did an extra, uh, basically interdural transposition of the gland, just opening a little bit of the, of the dura to allow me to push more superiorly. I drilled the, the dorsum and I removed the uh, posterior clinoid as well. This is with the 45 degree endoscope. Uh, there was a branch of the um, meningo meningeal, the, the, the hypophysial trunk right there. And we dissected and we removed that uh, part of the bone uh, that was very uh, stuck there because to the branch of the carotid, you don't want to just pull that out and uh, hurt the carotid as well. So we were able to get that posterior clinoid out, a little bit of the canal. I'll go further here. We opened the dura 
and we see the sixth nerve down there. So the sixth nerve is below the tumor and the tumor is up here. So I, I, I was able to really under visualization, understanding the position of the sixth and the third nerve to get this tumor out. I'll show you the third nerve we saw on the top of the tumor. So see the sixth nerve is down here. So I really under visualization was able to roll it, the tumor away from the lateral insertion. So this is a real petroclival, although it's not very large. And superiorly here on the other side of the arachnoid, the third nerve was right there. So then from there, I roll it down and we were able to get that whole lateral insertion. I use a 90 degree curette uh, to detach. Uh, I was respecting the position of the six and the third cranial nerves. And we got that whole tumor out of there as well, as you can see here. So um, nice resection. Uh, this patient did wonderful, no uh, cranial nerve deficits. This is the way I've been reconstructing nowadays. I, I do what I would call soft gasket seal. In some cases, I put some fat and then the nasal septal flap um, afterwards. Um, and here you see the fat and the reconstruction, complete resection. She did have a little bit of hyponatremia afterwards. It was, she had to be readmitted, but she did very, very well. I've been watching her more than a year now, no, no recurrence. You know, to be complete, we cannot talk about endonasia without talking about chordoma. So chordomas are probably revolutionized the treatment now with the endonasia approaches. Like this is a gentleman, he is 20, uh, I think he was 27 with this big tumor there. Um, and uh, I'll just show you like uh, the importance of sharp dissection. This is the basilar artery. And you can see here how, how important that we are dissecting that chordoma away from his basilar artery and vertebral arteries eventually here. Um, so see, this is, you can see in these videos, like how important is the, uh, you know, the fact that uh, in this case was Ricky Corral driving that camera so close, you really get a good view of what you're doing. And it's very important to have a good team for this because it's not like uh, you can just park the endoscope there. You have to be really back and forth. Uh, uh, and this is the dissection here on the vertebral arteries. Um, and here I'm, I'm using this knife to get the rest of the tumor that was on the dura. So we took our time removing the rest of the dura. The intracranial component was removed already. And, um, and here uh, the final view and uh, reconstruction with the collagen matrix, like I said, and uh, some fat in the, in the nasal septal flap. So here's the picture, this is post-op. This patient did have a leak. We actually had to do a uh, incision on the head and get the temporal parietal fascia to rotate it and, and then stop the leakage eventually. And he did very well with uh, no cranial nerve deficit, no problems and had proton beam radiation. And he is probably three, four years out with no recurrence. Um, just since I mentioned earlier, uh, if the petroclival meningioma is more on the petro side, that's, I would just do retrosigmoid just to show some uh, complementation here. This is another petroclival that most of the tumors on the petrous region. I also did a retrosigmoid. If it is located in the temptorium, I, I would do anterior petrosectomies. And uh, going down now to the foramen magnum, you see tumors like this very ventral. There are two, two aspects that I always watch it, is the fact that the tumor is, has to be above C1, C2 for me to uh, indicate an endonasal approach. And in between the vertebral arteries, like this case, this is a perfect case, it has been more uh, around 10 years I did this case, but it's very good uh, uh, demonstration of the perfect case for endonasal here, above that line and in between the vertebral arteries, as you can see here. So I would just uh, advance a little bit here, but you see the beautiful um, aspect that you can get these tumors out without touching the neurovascular structure. You see pica, the, the 12 cranial nerves and uh, reconstruction. We did a, a collagen matrix and the nasal septal flap. Um, and uh, this patient did have a leak um, and we, we had to take it back and then um, and it went very well. One thing I'll tell you, like what makes a difference uh, for us was the flap. The, before the flap, people will go back uh, to the operating room several times. Uh, and with the flap, when, we, when I say we take it back, usually it's only once and we just, just augment with a little fat or work on a corner and the patients do well. This is this patient with the, the foramen magnum meningioma eight years later 
never had a recurrence. I think we're 10 years out now. Uh, when the tumor is more eccentric like this, you have to really analyze and see, is this something that uh, should be doing a far lateral or something that can be done uh, endonasal? In this case, I, I, I did what we call focal. I'm gonna go straight here to the point. I did directly a condylectomy and uh, the tumor was just medial to the 12 nerve. So I still indicated a um, endonasal, see the vert behind the arachnoid there. And I uh, was able to go straight to the tumor without even open the sphenoid sinus. And uh, in this case here, using the, the bulky machine there, able to get that tumor out of there, preserving the 12 cranial nerve. Like again, we were medial to the left 12 cranial nerve. And you can see the corridor that we created to take that meningioma. This was another meningioma that I was watching, was growing, and I decided to do surgery then. See the vertebral artery, 12 cranial nerve, beautiful view, and uh, reconstruction with collagen matrix, a little bit of fat on the corridor. And I wanna show you this flap that we use in this case, it's different. Um, so we put some um, soft gasket seal, the collagen matrix, putting some things in the middle, like the gel foam expands and blocks the, uh, like a plug. It's basically a plug. And this is the flap of the nasopharynx. You can see the soft palate here and we put the flap back. So this is not a nasoceptal flap. It's just the flap of the nasopharynx and it looks like this. This patient did perfect, did very well. No leak, no deficit, did very well. Um, to finalize here, I'll, I'll, I'll show you some of the, um, the middle cranial fossa just to be uh, complete. Uh, the best, uh, uh, really a tumor to analyze the middle cranial fossa if we will do endonasal or an open approach. I love the trigeminal schwannomas. If the trigeminal schwannoma insinuates to the sphenoid sinus like this and allows an, a window, you can actually go endonasal and take this tumor out. So let me just show you how we do. We skeletonize the carotid like that. Um, see, the, this is middle cranial fossa with the periosteum already exposed. The cella will be right there. And, uh, and we will basically take the, the bone away. And the, the importance of taking the bone of the, in front of the carotid is because then you can mobilize the carotid and you can reach posteriorly by going lateral uh, through that corridor. I was with cranial nerve uh, stimulator. Uh, here we identify where the sixth cranial nerve is crossing. And also I monitor the motor for uh, the fifth cranial nerve, opening the dura and then, uh, Here's a, like with the bulk of the tumor, but the most important uh, moment is this one here where we are dissecting the tumor down and away from the six kernel nerve that is going to the superior orbital fissure right there. This is the cartouche stimulator. So I identified the location of the sixth nerve using it. And by going around that uh, tumor, we were able to get the whole tumor out by using an endonasal corridor. And then we just plug with the collagen matrix and put the nasal septal flap at the end there. And uh, let me just show you uh, the, uh, how it looked like at the end here, at the end of the video. This is the post-op MRI uh, looking like a pretty good resection. Um, of course, tumors located uh, like this, see the carotid guards. So I'm not gonna go here in the nasal. That, that I do a peeling of the middle fossa. This is another one that we will do a peeling of the middle fossa. The carotid is blocking the view here. So that, that's something I will do a peeling of the middle fossa. Uh, by identifying V2, this is a craniotomy, V3 down here, and it's staying extra dural, elevating the dura, then you expose the lateral aspect of gasserian ganglion and uh, take those tumors out. Um, the, uh, to finalize here, uh, the chondrosarcomas are very uh, interesting tumors because they, they are originated on the uh, utroclival synchondrosis and they can grow to middle fossa, they can go to posterior fossa, and even, even in the cervical region. By coming endonasal and accessing the petroclival synchondrosis earlier, we can actually go to all these locations. And this is what uh, I'm going to show you here. This is the cella up here. And this is a, a succable chondrosarcoma, um, soft. Sometimes they can be calcified and difficult to remove, uh, exposing the video nerve here. That's the uh, dura of the middle cranial fossa. Then we uh, follow this tumor posteriorly, all endonasal, and using an angle scope, we can actually go uh, behind the carotid and also angle drills. We use it uh, these days. Early, early in my career, we didn't have angle drills. Now they are very helpful. 
The Q-tip is also very helpful to uh, move the, um, I use a lot in pituitary adenomas when there is a descent of the diaphragma or in situations like this. So you can push with the Q-tip. And um, here's like dissecting that uh, middle cranial fossa. I'll just show you here like us, this is Dorello's canal on top of the petrous bone. And that's the, the six cranial nerve you will see behind right there going right there. That's the six cranial nerve. She had a six cranial nerve palsy before surgery. Uh, got some improvement, but not completely. That's the jugular vein. And we're going behind the carotid with an angoscope. And, and now I'm taking tumor from the cervical region around the carotid and the jugular vein there. All extradurally coming through the nostril and uh, no leakage of fluid. That's the beauty of this approach. And then we covered everything with the uh, nasal septal flap. You can see here um, the, the all tumor resected, necros cave is cleared up and we never touched the lateral, only coming in the nasal. So again, the chondrosarcoma is really good indication for coming uh, in the nasal. Of course, there is a need for the, the, the open approaches and endonasal, as you saw in my presentation. This is the last video that shows an open approach where we're coming with the endoscope extra durally. This was a low-grade sarcoma of the middle cranial fossa. It was invading the sphenoid. So we actually came endonasal, as you can see here. This is V2 and V3 going down there. And this is uh, connecting the same surgery with an open approach and endonasal. So you can see where the surgeon is out there. You know, this, we, we, this is at the end of the resection. We basically connected the open with the endonasal. And this, we're having some fun here uh, dissecting the tumor. And uh, this is a beautiful video that shows the importance of uh, both approaches, endonasal and endoscopic, complementing each other uh, for uh, the best for treatment for the patients. So with that, uh, I'll finish here. Uh, thank you again for the invitation. Uh, I really uh, I will be waiting for the invitation to be in person there next time. And uh, we will uh, be happy to receive uh, Dr. Taha with us here in May uh, 19 to 21 for our course. And all of the others uh, interested, just let me know and uh, we'll be happy to receive you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for this uh outstanding presentation. It's very interesting <clears throat> the presentation and uh, thank you very much uh, for, for that. I agree with you about uh, uh, olfactory groove meningioma. Yes, uh, the, 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 you are expert in uh, endovascular endoscopic surgery, but you the, the most important is what is the best for the, the patients. Mm -hmm. So the, we have, uh, we chose endoscopic, transorbital, trans uh, able, uh, subfrontal, uh, or uh, craniotomy. So that, that's, uh, this is the, the, the important uh, things. Uh, I think uh, <clears throat> it's uh, um, not that because you are best neurosurgeon in endoscopy. You persist to do just an endoscopy. That's, uh, yeah. that's a let, lesson what, what, what we learn about. Yeah, <laughs> let me tell you a, a quick story. Uh, once I, uh, I'm not gonna say names or the country, but this person from a different country came and showed it to me. Uh, they were very happy and proud that they were able to remove a parafalcine meningioma through the nose. That this place, they have a group of skull based surgeons that do only endonasal and another group that do only craniotomy. And he showed me the video where they went through the nose and he basically aspirate bilateral frontal lobes to get to the tumor. Uh, yeah. And I was like, what's <laughs> happening here? And I mentioned like, I, I think this should have been done through a craniotomy it will be much more sense. And the answer they gave me was, well, if we decided craniotomy, we could not do the surgery, we'll be the other group. And I said, that's not the answer. The answer is like, what is the best for the patient? If, if it's better for the patient, you should send to the other group. But I think being able to offer all the 360 degrees around it and you, your team to make a decision together and decide what is the best for the patient is, is the best option. 
like you said, Dr. Ta. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, do you have uh, some question, uh, Adria? Yes. Hello, and thank you again for your um, presentation. Um, I just have a, a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is regarding the, um, uh, the the packing. Do you use packing after? Uh, I mean, when, um, when you do the um, uh, nasal septal flap, do you use packing after surgery? Very good question. Uh, yesterday, we actually did one patient where the flap was reused, and the packing that we used was actually a fat graft. So sometimes we will use a flap first and then some fat graft. This is got published by the group in Boston, uh, Brigham Women as well as uh, something that is actually helpful. Uh, but we do use for the most part, uh, if we use a flap, uh, most of the time what we will do is a uh, 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 nasal pore and uh, mara cells. I don't know if uh, the name is the same in uh, France and for you guys. But yeah, those are the, the main packing that mm -hmm. we use. And then Maracels, we just pull out uh, usually about five, seven days after surgery. Mm -hmm. We keep them with some uh, oral antibiotic uh, because of the packing. Um, and uh, like I said earlier, we don't do lumbar drains unless they leak. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, thank you. And the uh, second quick question is regarding the fact that you mentioned that whenever you note there is edema in the uh, frontal lobe, you'd mm -hmm. rather perform an uh, orbitozygomatic approach. Is that correct? And can you please comment a little bit more? Yeah, yeah. so, so uh, first of all, if there's a brain edema and I and makes sense to go through the nose, I would prefer to go through the nose to avoid opening with the edema for those large ones. And that's another reason that I would do a stage one endonasal for those large tumors, because then the edema goes down after the bulking of the tumor. Um, if the edema is on the left side, it's I usually will do a right side regular craniotomy without, uh, without much problem, uh, without taking the orbit. If, if it is on the left side, and it and is better to go to the left side because the tumor is more on the left. I'm more more inclined to take the orbit uh, like an orbital zygomatic in those cases to avoid brain manipulation on the left frontal lobe. So that's kind of my algorithm. Uh, so uh, if I can still approach to the right, I just drill the orbit down and I usually don't take the rim of the orbit. Mm -hmm. On the left side, I'm more inclined to take the, take the rim to avoid brain manipulation. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Do you have questions? Yes, for, for a large uh, uh, olfactory growth management, I usually use, uh, because I, I have no experience on uh, mm -hmm. endoscopic for this region. Mm -hmm. But uh, I do it uh, lateral, uh, subfrontal, like a uh, pterional approach. Mm -hmm. And uh, I drill the, 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 the roof, roof of the orbit. The, the, the orbit. And uh, we have all vascular, uh, vascular vascularization first mm -hmm. and with the bulking. Yeah. Okay. yeah. We don't see the, the, the brain. Yeah. We develop and uh, with the cavitron, and uh, after we can go to the uh, the middle line, the open the falx uh, mm -hmm. to take the crystalline if necessary. Go mm -hmm. to the, the other side, and finally that we go in posterior to to control uh, the, the, the 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 vessel, and we take the the, the, the this tumor without uh, complication, and we try to preserve infection. Right. I tell I tell that for uh, for for uh, preservation of uh, infection. So. Yeah. It, it's uh, the, the, we have uh, a number of uh, the, the, this menagema with uh, excellent results. So we do what we <laughs> what we know. Yeah, <laughs> what is, is good for our our patients. Yes. Yeah, I'm but uh, I, I, I I I want to 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 progress and do it yeah. uh, for the 
the best cases uh, in uh, endovascular, uh, endo, nasal endosurgery. Yeah, it's very surgery. interesting. I wrote my uh, my series of olfactory groove meningioma recently, and it's very interesting. The endoscopic cases that I did endonasal only with a complete resection were cases where actually the size was medium to large because the olfaction was already removed by the tumor. Mm. The ones I did craniotomy were usually for olfactory groove actually small because those are small ones have still uh, olfaction, small in terms, because you saw some of the cases I showed was still kind of big, but, but the, the statistically smaller. And the very large ones are the ones that I combine, endonasal first, followed by the open. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think that I manipulate less the brain by doing this in stages, like there's less edema on the second surgery, so then you don't need to do uh, much um to to really take the tumor out of there but the sequence you described dr taha is exactly what i do too when i do open approach you kind of devascularize first the bulk and then i do like more the lateral approach for for midline large anterior skull based meningiomas because i can see behind the tumor with the lateral view find anterior cerebral arteries and roll the tumor forward Yes. And versus some people like a bicoronal coming from the front. I don't, I don't understand how they dissect behind the tumor there. Yeah, I, the, me too, I don't like uh, with that. The, with the problem of uh, sinus. Uh, sinus uh, yeah, so plus the frontal sinus problem, as yes. well. Yes, yes, yes I yes. agree. So I do prefer, I prefer lateral smaller here yes. If, yes. If, when I'm doing craniotomy for anterior scope yes. based meningioma. We have the same, same style. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, another question. Uh, Manu, uh, celebrity, you can uh, unmute your mic. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Professor Said, for have just given me the speech. I'm a resident in the surgery here in the. I have just a question to ask to Professor Provedelo. Uh, yeah. I just begin to give him thanks for the presentation was very good. Uh, my question is you know, if uh, we are going to to approach uh, by under, uh, under uh, endoscope by endoscopic and approach to make it for pituitary uh, gland tumors okay. if it can, it can happen that the the sinus the, the sphenoid sinus is a very good a very big uh, wall or to mean that the the, the hole is very thick. Is there any possibility to just uh, approach uh, that spheroid sinus, or it's going to be the contraindication of uh, endonasal endoscopic uh, approach? So, if I understood your question, is if the tumor is invading the sphenoid sinus, is that what you're saying? I would like to say this: when are you making uh, uh, by endoscopic endonasal approach for uh, pituitary gland uh, uh, tumors? This, the second time, if we may, I, I don't mistake, is to make the sphenoid time. Arriving at the sphenoid time, it can happen that the, the sphenoid sinus can have a, a, a thick hole. The hole is very thick. In and a second then, surgery, like a re-operation re you're talking about? About the operation, because it is one of the cases we get here. We had yeah. a patient, we had a, a sphenoid sinus, who, which had uh, a very thick uh, hole, and it was so very difficult to approach it by endonasal uh, endoscopic approach. Uh, after mm -hmm. I've done that, to we try to make to force it by making it. After we get uh, 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 a uh, peri peri hemorrhagy, and that uh, that patient died. It. That's why I would like to ask you the question: if the euh, professeur Saïd, vous pouvez m'aider avec juste euh, la question, je voulais dire ceci. Si vous avez, si on a, par exemple, on veut aborder par voie endoscopique endonasale, les tumeurs principalement de la région médiane, la, le, les tumeurs de, 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 de la voie, les tumeurs cellaires principalement, les tumeurs hypophysaires. Et il oui. peut nous arriver qu'au niveau, arriver au temps euh, sphénoïdal, la paroi de, de, de sinus sphénoïdal soit épais. 
Est-il possible qu'il y ait-il une technique par laquelle on peut aborder cela toujours par voie endoscopique endonasale ou soit ça devient une contre-indication et ça demande des approches par voie haute Non, mais le problème, c'est que... Oui, uh, il parle de uh, the uh, anterior wall of the sinus, sphenoid sinus is uh, very thick. So we can drill it. Yeah. We, yes, if we you, can drill it. Yeah, if you're talking about the bone, you can, we can drill that, um, the sphenoid. I don't think that's a limitation. Uh, sometimes in reoperation, there's a lot of scar that we have to manipulate. It can be thick as well. Sometimes uh, in reoperation, I need to open the dura becomes so thick with the kerosene, actually, almost like taking care like a bone. But, uh, you know, you, the most important is to be oriented with anatomy. Like, you don't want to, you know, make sure you, you, you know where your carotid arteries are, you know, the optic canals. As, as long as you're oriented, you can use drill and, and some power, um, you know, instruments to get through those thick uh, tissues. Yes, Professor, as I'm speaking, uh, I was uh, just speaking in African, uh, African cases, because in African cases, it can happen that you have no instrument that can permit drill. That's why I would like to ask you this question to know if uh, uh, the, the, the sinus, the, the whole of the sinus, the of the sinus is very thick. Is there uh, going to be the contradiction of endonasal endoscopic? Uh, yeah, I think, I think you touched the most important aspect, uh, Celebre is the contraindication is not the endonasal, but maybe the fact that you don't have all the instruments to go through, you know, I think that that becomes an issue. If you if you take me to a situation like that, I, I, and, and then I, I may need to abort because if I don't have a good drill, if I don't have a, a good instrument, it becomes then a problem. Um, you know, when I started with endonasal, we, we used to use the chisel and the, you know, to kind of, to kind of, tap tap and and crack the yes. bone uh, we don't do that much anymore but that that will be sometimes an alternative uh, but if you don't know exactly the anatomy behind you don't have neuro navigation the, the you don't know what the carotid is then i agree with you then it, that's that becomes the limitation is the lack of uh, instruments you know because it's not for a reason that endonasal endoscopic surgery evolved uh, only recent in the last few years because technology had to to adjust to to that right so if you don't have those instruments then it becomes a limitation thank you professor yeah uh, kisubi from dr kisubi okay uh, guillaume Yes, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, just, I assume that you uh, you perform a bilateral approach, uh, extended approach for most of your tumor removal. Uh, did you perform bilateral nasoceptal flap or only uh, unilateral to uh, minimize uh, nasal morbidity? Yeah, correct. Good question. So to answer quickly, what we do in general, I prefer a nasoceptal flap elevated from the right side and the left mucosa, we curve back to cover that donated area on the right side. So we use the left mucosa to turn back anteriorly and cover the septum. And that causes less crusting on the uh, nasal area. And uh, we don't use two bilateral. Uh, no, usually one well done unilateral flap is what we use. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. That's all for me. It's uh, interesting to work uh, uh, with the team. It's uh, very interesting because uh, we learn uh, each other. Uh, learn. Uh, we learn uh, yeah. to be gentle with. Uh, all the nasal yeah. structure, like the mucosa, <laughs> and yeah. uh, that's uh, it's, uh, it's very interesting. And the uh, the, the uh, uh, ENT uh, surgeon uh, uh, learn more on the neuro neurosurgical uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, philosophy. If, uh, for sure, do. for sure. Yes. Yeah, I'll tell you that historically, uh, around twenty years ago, neurosurgeons only used the speculum. 
and we'll put this speculum without seeing what is on the other side, but knew very well how to deal with this phenoid yes. sinus. And the, and the ENT is doing fast. They always had this principle of don't go to this phenoid. This phenoid complications are there. Don't go to this. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we showed to the uh, ENTs how to deal with this phenoid and the proximity with the high complexity neurovascular structures. And we learned from them all the other aspects of the nose and the importance of the uh, smell and mucosa and yes. things like that. So it's very true. Yes, and the care after surgery, it's uh, very important. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, I think we have not a question. I think we have a question from Dr. Ah, yeah. ah okay. Men? Hello. We, uh, both, yeah, hello. Um, okay, thank hello. you very much. Uh, it's very nice, uh, very nice presentation. My thank question you. is uh, when you, uh, for a new tumor, when it's, um, uh, you program two surgeries, I mean, uh, endonasal and uh, uh, cranial, mm -hmm. uh, 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 how many times do you, uh, uh, wait. I mean, wait between the two uh, uh, surgeries. Yeah, very good question. Uh, I I usually wait about uh, more than three months. So average on my cases oh. is three or four months because I think at that point the patient recover the blood. You know, is not anemic anymore. Is stronger and everything. Uh, the exception is based on vision. So I had one patient that. Uh, uh, I did the surgery on the nasal, but her eyes, the vision was still not getting better. I was not able to, uh, to get a good decompression of the optic nerves. So the, the shortest that I've done was two months. In that case, I was worried. And two months later, I went back. The reason I didn't right away is because you need some time for the flap to heal. Because you do put a flap after the first surgery. And then uh, I didn't want to cause a leak by coming with the second surgery. Uh -huh. So I did in two months and uh, it did very well. The flap was healed and I got the rest of the tumor. Her vision improved and it was a success. So most of the time, three, four months, I've done two months and I've done one year later as well for a, another gentleman that had a lung cancer. I did the surgery uh, initially on the nasal. And then he discovered lung cancer. Then he started dealing with the lung cancer as a priority. But then a year later, his tumor was growing back. So I did a craniotomy and took the rest out. And he's doing well. OK, that's great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Jamila is uh, head of uh, neurosurgery, pediatric neurosurgery in uh, Cairo, in a oh, military wow. hospital in Cairo. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, thank you very much, uh, Professor Prevedelo, and uh, see you in May. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, um, enjoy the, the time with you guys, and um, you know, hopefully. I have a small question, sir. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Dr. Oh, yes, uh, could you <laughs> oh, Go ahead. Yes. Thank you, thank you for this beautiful and very rich presentation. Thank you. And we, we learned a lot and we are a learner in neurosurgery from Republic Democratic of Congo. Oh, wow, good. So my, my small question is, can the cerebellar protein tumor also be approached nasally? Cerebellum, cerebellum protein tumor. Cerebellar tumor? Good question. Here's the, here's what I think. Most of the CP angle tumors, uh, like a vestibular yeah. schwannoma, they push the facial nerve ventrally. Mm -hmm. So it does not make sense to come into nasal and see the facial nerve first. I, I'm sure you can get there and, and approach, but it doesn't make sense. So for vestibular schwannomas, we just do traditional, the retrosig and translabyrinthine. And mm -hmm. if it's very small, we do middle fossa. Um, yeah. 
If it is a meningioma, it goes to what I showed earlier, like you can reach there, but it has to be a tumor primarily, primarily uh, retroclival. Because if it is, um, if it is primarily petrous, then I, I just do traditional surgery. I, I don't think it makes sense to gum in a nasal. Sometimes the basilar is in your way or branches of the basilar, it doesn't make any sense. So the bottom line is for the most part, CP angle tumor, you will be doing a regular approach and not in the nasal. Thank you, Professor. Proud Thank of you. you. Okay. I think it's a last question. Right. Okay. Thank you again, Professor Prevedelo. And uh, it, it's, uh, it was a great uh, pleasure uh, for us. Thank you. A lot from you. And, yeah. Uh, Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Mm -hmm. I see you in the uh, reunion island too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Merci beaucoup, Thank and I'll, Merci I'll, beaucoup. I'll hopefully one day I visit your island. Uh, now you made me so uh, like uh, you know I want to be there. Like it's so beautiful. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. I am very very glad. Yeah. <laughs> Thank I you. I am yeah. very glad for this Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.